Hello and welcome back to The Note. We have what you could call a note by public demand today. Uh, it's now more than four years since I first interviewed Russell Napier, a stock market historian and uh, writer of Anatomy of the Bear. That was back in Florida and he was suggesting uh, back in the, the spring of 2009 that we were going to see a protracted rally in stocks thanks to the Fed's easy monetary policy, followed by what you might call a crash. Naturally, that created a great deal of interest, so let's discuss with him how things have changed over those last four years, particularly in the light of the recent actions or otherwise, the Federal Reserve. Russell, thank you very much for joining me thank again you. today. Take me through what has changed uh, about your hypothesis since 2009. Okay, well, the most likely scenario when that extreme monetary policy began is that it would result in inflation, yep. that it would reduce credit growth in America. Uh, and from which it seemed likely, but also to me that we'd get extreme inflation in emerging markets. That monetary policy mm. would be forced to be particularly e easy there, and they didn't need it. So inflation coming from emerging markets back to America, America generating credit growth, more inflation, and if that's the case, then at a certain level of inflation and a certain level of bond yields, then the market would begin to yeah, fall. You, you were predicting that bond yields were going to shoot up and that that was going to be the trigger for the, for the stocks correct. to come down. Mm. Now you've had the Great Reset since then, as you called it, which was about two years ago. Take me through the Great Reset. Well, in about May, uh, May 2011, I changed my mind. I think there was ample evidence that this was not going to result in inflation. And then if you're a long-term investor, you have to worry about the opposite of inflation, which was deflation. So the two things that weren't working is that America was not generating lots of credit growth. Right. Uh, and therefore, it wasn't creating lots of money growth and presumably not lots of inflation. But perhaps m much more importantly than that, the inflation and the wage inflation we saw in emerging markets, and particularly in China, was not spilling out. It was being taken in China in particular on corporate profit margins and not spilling out into the rest of the world. Now, the way emerging markets work, their business cycle is driven by their external accounts. So it seemed to me they were much more likely to get an external account shock for emerging markets. No inflation in America, and we should be worrying about deflation. And I think some of the evidence right. from the first half of this year was pointing very clearly to that for emerging markets. So very briefly, where does that lead us in terms of a stock market forecast. You take a lot of interest in cyclically mm. adjusted price earnings multiples. Where roughly is the S&P going to come to rest once this deflationary shock has worked its way through the system? Okay, well we're at the high end of the range at 23 times. You either believe that that's a, sick, that that's a mean reverting measure of value or not a mean reverting measure of value. I do believe that. Mm. Uh, on a mean reverting measure of value, it's going to head towards 10 uh, and uh, potentially below 10. The, my book focuses on what would possibly... Which implies an S&P of around about 500. Well, I think it can certainly be, go below 500, between 400 and 500, somewhere in that range. It's best not to be too precise. The bottom valuations, there's actually quite a big range in there. You have to take an average, and an average of four points is actually mm. not that accurate. So we're somewhere uh, in that range. But it's deflation that makes equities cheap. Uh, and I can see the deflation coming through a major emerging market growth slowdown, through an inability to get credit growth growing in America, through a, a depreciating Japanese yen. I think all these things have been building through this year. Now, where should we be most worried? As I understand it, we've heard a lot of concern about Asia. You're suggesting that perhaps the great area of concern in emerging markets should be the area nobody's talking about, more or less, which is Eastern Europe. Yeah, well, investors are a bit like greyhounds. They tend to chase the thing that's moving, and sometimes they run right past the real rabbits. Hmm. So what's moving is the Indonesian rupiah, the Indian rupee, the Brazilian real, and that's where yeah. investors are looking. It's, in our business, it's ultimately stocks, which are important and not flows. And right. if you look at the stock of external debt to GDP ratios, which are ultimately why countries default or get into trouble, one looks very clear at Eastern Europe. That's where the money has been borrowed has been so gross uh, that it's very, very unlikely that these countries will ever be able to pay it back. So our next shock right. is already beginning to develop, I think, in countries like Turkey, but potentially somewhere like Poland as well. So will they devalue or do they impose exchange controls? How do they deal with this? How does this tip over into crisis? Okay, well you either, when you're in a situation where you are becoming uncompetitive and you've got too much foreign debt, uh, you have to, have to deflate to become competitive and pay back your foreigners or you have to devalue. If your foreign debt's too big and you devalue, you go bankrupt. So there's an initial attempt to do this via deflation, but I'm glad you mentioned the word capital controls because mm -hmm. that's the third way to do it, which is to simply find a way of not paying back your debt. And I think one of the most frightening things is that Christine Lagarde endorsed the use of capital controls, and if I can quote, in some circumstances for emerging markets. So the probability of this is going up. For those who remember the Asian crisis, we had one country that brought in exchange controls against IMF advice, Malaysia. Uh, I was living out there at the time. It caused havoc. I suspect that exchange controls are much more of a probability in this particular emerging market cycle than they have been in the past. 
Okay, Russell, thank you very much. It's, as always, a great pleasure. Uh, and I think, in conclusion, I know from the feedback we get that some people strongly agree with Russell, others strongly disagree. I think what we can all agree on is that he is unfailingly very interesting.